So I am out in the vineyard, Kelly Mitchell with Julie Lemgare. She is actually a luxury consulting winemaker. And look where we are. Oh, wow. Yes, look where we are. We are in the Rutherford dust. I'm so excited. Actually, here, I'll hold up a little Rutherford dust for you. Check it out. Rutherford dust. So we are Lovely. Napa Valley, and central Napa Valley, right? Yeah, right in the heart of the valley. There it goes. Okay, tell me what you love about the microclimate in Rutherford dust. Well, I have to say, um, it's all, I mean, there's no best or worst place in Napa Valley. I feel really fortunate to work with at least eight different AVAs of CAB in Napa Valley. So, you know, it's like kittens in the litter. No ugly ones as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> in Rutherford, there is such a personality to the fruit. What I love about being midway up Napa Valley is the, the warmth is increasing the further we get away from the bay. Okay. You know, because of course the fog and the coastal influence is heavy in the Carneros. And then you move from Carneros to Coombsville and Oak Knoll, and then you're moving Stag's Leap, and then Yauntville and Oakville. And as you crawl further and further north, we're warmer, we're drier, and oh, yes. especially Mid Valley, where we are right now, you know, there's just an awful lot of wonderful light exposure. Now, when you manage the farming, as you can see, the canopy around us, this is the most brilliantly managed canopy, I swear, for miles around. And what kind of grapes are we looking at? Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, what else? Hey. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Welcome to Rutherford, it's gotta be Cab. <laughs> but you can see that this is vertical. Um, this is a VSP Cordon, but notice how artfully it has been trained to give itself it, natural shading. It really does look beautiful. So they, the leaves are protecting the grapes themselves. Yeah, and there's actually a scientific ratio. That's why I think this is one of the most beautifully farmed vineyards in the area. The ratio is one to two leaves worth of sunlight dappling is the sweet spot for the development of this amazing, rich, robust tannic profile, followed by once the verasion where you know the they all start green and then the green berries start going red because it's gonna cabernet is gonna end up being red <laughs> <laughs> so the anthocyanins which i'm shorthanding here a little bit but you know the color yes comes after the thank tannin. you we all appreciate you <laughs> translating for yeah, us yeah <laughs> so you know once you start having the dappled red to green verasion phase of the grapes before the clusters go all the way red you've got the anthocyanins are building. So you've already built a lot of, again in shorthand, the structure of the wine, the bones go down early. And then the color and the intensity and you know the phenolic profile of the skin to juice ratio and how resolved and ripe the seeds are and how thick the skins are and how rich and you know as they continue to evolve the balance of the acid to the potential flavor compounds and phenolics to the actual sugar level in the juice of the grape itself. That's all the magic. That's a lot of magic. A lot of better living through chemistry. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but what I will say is um, this is just an amazing place. You know, this Stag's Leap, Powell Mountain, you know, Oak Knoll, Coombsville, and actually right on the southern tip. Mm -hmm. I, just missed Atlas Peak, I swear by a fence post. Ah. But when I think about, those are some of the vineyards that I'm working with this vintage. I love them all for different reasons. But if I was just going to shorthand, what is it that I'm just thrilled about with this Rutherford you know, vineyard? It's gonna be the absolute magnitude of this fruit. And the, So tell me a little bit about this year, if you yeah. would, because we've had some ups and downs, right? Yep. And it's been drought and kind of scary from the drought standpoint. Drought marches on. <laughs> yes. And, and <clears throat> I don't think, I mean, I think it's been a few years since we've had what they would call a bad crop. Yes. It's been several years. Yeah. So what is your outlook for this vintage, for the 2016? Are we going to call it 2016 if it's yeah. picked in 2016? Vintage 16. Here there we, we go. go. What's your outlook well, for this vintage? It's definitely brightened up in the last two weeks, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple of things early in the year that everybody was really loving. Um, since 2011, we have not had a lot of rain. The California drought march is on, now it's 16. That means you've got four vintages here in a row that have been impacted by drought. 
12, 13, 14, there was a cumulative stress because not only did we have, you know, drought, but we had virtually no refreshing rains even after December in certain years. So the root flush, you know, because this part of the vine is above the ground, but there's yes. an awful lot of important news <clears throat> going on below the ground as well. And irrigation can only cover so much. So a lot of the roots had not really gotten a good flush until the start of 16. We were so lucky this year. We actually got a good amount of rain. And for once in the last several years, we finally got all of the vineyard floor wet. We got a lot of amazing fertilizers worked in. You know, if you had your compost on, you were able to get all the nutrients from the compost into the vineyard. That was the first time in four years where we had really gotten that boost early in season. Excellent. Nice, you know, nice bud break, nice set. Got a little warm in August, and that's where people started getting nervous because, you know. You don't want those 100 degree temperatures well, for very long. To, it <laughs> shot to the hundreds for a number of days. 15 was the earliest vintage on record in the valley. And wow. we just, we were looking like if the heat held like that, it was going to happen again. The sparkling started going off in yes. late July, just like last year. It was like, oh, here we go. It's just spiking. The heat's rolling. The grapes are building sugar faster than phenolics. And then right as the sparkling had kind of quit coming in, all of a sudden, this marine layer parked off the coast. And it was a very thick marine layer. It was almost a couple thousand feet thick. Is this what we're seeing come in in the mornings now? Well, you've really been seeing the impact of not only a great marine layer, but also because it's warm inland, there's been a lot of draw for the, you know, the push-pull effect that brings the fog further and further into the valley. Yes. And, you know, I live in Russian River and my commute takes me three hours round trip every day. So I see the weather <laughs> all the way. All perspectives of from it. From <laughs> Russian River to Chalk Hill to Calistoga to, I mean, you know, all the way down Valley to the Napa Airport and back. So I'm, I'm pretty good with the weather. Love I see it. a lot of it. <laughs> What's your say, favorite yeah. part about the winemaking process? What do you... What do you love most about what you do? Oh, wow. I think it's honestly, um, for me, it's how these three things that I love all come together. So it's the, the, what would you say? I guess the synthesis of I love farming. I love winemaking. And I love drinking wine and sharing that with people. And I don't think one stands alone. I think some people really can find their bliss in just that one spot. But for me, I like to make the whole circle. So, you know, I'm a farmer's wife, I'm a farmer's daughter, I'm a fifth generation farmer myself. I love farming. <laughs> but as a winemaker, I'm first generation, 12th vintage. I mean, it's, it's my calling, it's my passion. I, I'm always challenged by it. I find a lot of joy. I've worked on 21 different varietals. I have a real sucker for Clonal Cabernet Sauvignon and Clonal Pinot Noir. Love it. But I love to share wine, literally from all over the world with all kinds of people and I just I'm passionate about wine education I'm not you know although I'm doing a lot of consulting in Napa Valley and Russian River Valley I am definitely not a wine snob to just my own backyard I adore truly wine from everywhere you brought up something that <clears throat> is near and dear to my heart because yeah it, there are so many people out there that that really are intimidated by um the wine snobs of this world, oh, you gosh. know, we have a few, ones we have a few. <laughs> yes. And so <clears throat> I, I would love it if you would speak for a moment to those people that are, you know, afraid to speak their minds or intimidated to speak their minds about what they enjoy, what they taste, that sort of thing. Because the more that I learn about wine, the more I am brutally aware how much I don't know. And I think that that's even for somebody like you, there's yeah. still Oh. It's it's a lifelong learning you process. You never stop learning. You never do. I have to say, for the people who like to, um, I guess, stand upon someone else's shoulders to make themselves feel taller, they're not doing all of us in the industry a great favor because yeah. you shouldn't have to know a secret handshake or the secret password <laughs> to love wine. I mean, it's been around for millennia. This is really no secret. Yes. People have had wine on their table. In you the know, Roman days. Oh my God. And, and even Finitum. before that. Oh my God. Uh, truly on every continent, I promise you, there's been a variation of wine on the table. And I really believe that, you know, it's an everyday pleasure. 
Of course, there are some bottles that are, you know, uber special, and believe me, I give it some thought on birthdays and anniversaries and <laughs> yes. family holidays, because, you know, everybody always looks at the wine, and they're like, oh, what'd you bring? <laughs> Absolutely. A little pressure there. But oh, yeah, I'm it's, sure. It's always a real challenge to explain at an entry level and at a connoisseur class level why, you know, this is special or this is different or whatever, but you have to back it down to the universal question, do you like it? Absolutely. And do you like it? And then you get to the harder question. Why do you like it? And why do you like it is what, if I'm talking to people and trying to figure out what wines they might enjoy, that's where I get my clues. And Definitely. if you want dry but yet fruit forward or refreshing, I think wine offers the most amazing spectrum from around the world.